on thy throne above, and through thy Holy Spirit in our human nature here below, a way has been opened up by which every human cry of need can be taken up into and touch the life and the love of God, and receive in answer whatsoever it shall ask. Blessed Jesus, in whom, as the Son, the path of prayer has been opened up, and who givest us assurance of the answer, we beseech thee, teach thy people to pray. O let this each day be the sign of our sonship, that like thee we know that the Father heareth us always. Amen. No. God hears prayers. The simplest view of prayer is taken throughout Scripture. It dwells not on the reflex influence of prayer on our heart and life, although it abundantly shows the connection between prayer as an act and prayer as a state. It rather fixes with great definiteness the objectivity or real purpose of prayer to obtain blessing, gifts, deliverances from God, quote, ask and it shall be given you, unquote, Jesus says. However true and valuable the reflection may be, that God, foreseeing and foreordaining all things, has also foreseen and foreordained our prayers as links in the chain of events. Of cause and effect as a real power, yet we feel convinced that this is not the light in which the mind can find peace in this great subject, nor do we think that here is the attractive power to draw us in prayer. We feel, rather, that such a reflection diverts the attention from the object whence comes the impulse, life, and strength of prayer. The living God, contemporary, and not merely eternal. Footnote. Should it not rather be contemporary, because eternal, in the proper meaning of that latter word, and the footnote. The living, merciful, holy one, God manifesting himself to the soul, God saying, Seek my face. This is the magnet that draws us. This alone can open hearts and lips. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we have the full solution of the difficulty. He prayed on earth, and that not merely as man, but as the Son of God incarnate. His prayer on earth is only the manifestation of his prayer from all eternity, when in the divine council he was set up as the Christ. The Son was appointed to be heir of all things. From all eternity the Son of God was the way, the mediator. He was, to use our imperfect, uh, imperfect language, from eternity speaking unto the Father on behalf of the world. Seraphim. That's S-P-H-R-I. S-P-H-R-I. The Hidden Life, Chapter 6. See also the Lord's Prayer, page 12. With Christ in the School of Prayer. 18th lesson. Whose is this image? Or, prayer in harmony with the destiny of man. Quote, He saith unto them, Whose is this image in superscription? Unquote. Matthew 22, 20. Quote, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Unquote. Genesis 1, 26. Whose is this image? It was by this question that Jesus foiled his enemies when they thought to take him and settle the matter of duty in regard to the tribune. The question and the principle it re- involves are of universal application. Nowhere more thoroughly and truly than in man himself. The image he bears decides his destiny. Bearing God's image, he belongs to God. Prayer to God is what he was created for. Prayer is part of the wondrous likeness he bears to his divine origin of the deep mystery of the fellowship of love, in which the three one has his blessedness. Prayer is the earthly image and likeness. The more we meditate on what prayer is, and the wonderful power with God which it has, the more we feel constrained to ask who and what man is that such a place in God's counsels should have been allotted to him. Sin has so degraded him that from what he is now, we can form no conception of what he was meant to be. We must turn back to God's own record of man's creation to discover there what God's purpose was and what the capacities with which man was endowed for the fulfillment of that purpose. Man's destiny 
appears clearly from God's language at creation. It was to fill, to subdue, to have dominion over the earth and all in it. And the three expressions show us that man was meant, as God's representative, to hold rule here on earth as God's victory. victory. He was to fill God's place, himself subject to God. He was to keep all else in subjection to him. It was the will of God that all this was to be done on earth, should be done through him. The history of the earth was to be entirely in his hands. In accordance with such a destiny was the position he was to occupy and the power at his disposal. When an earthly sovereign sends a viceroy to a distant province, it is understood that he advises as to the policy to be adopted and that that advice is acted on, that he is at liberty to apply for troops and the other means needed for carrying out the policy or maintaining the dignity of the empire. It is his policy to be to not approve of if if his policy be not approved of. He is recalled to make way for someone who better understands his sovereign's desires. <clears throat> as long as he is trusted, his advice is carried out. As God's representative, man was to have rule. All was to have been done under his will and rule, on his advice, and at his request, heaven was to have bestowed its blessing on earth. His prayer was to have been the wonderful, both simple and most natural channel, in which the intercourse between the king and heaven and his faithful servant man, as lord of the world, would, was to have been maintained. The destinies of the world were given into the power of the wishes, the will, the prayer of man. With sin, all this underwent a terrible change. Man's fall brought all creation into the curse. With redemption, the beginning was seen of a glorious restoration. No sooner had God begun in Abraham to form for himself a people with whom kings, yea, the great king, should come forth, then we see what power the prayer of God's faithful servant has to decide the destinies of those who come into contact with him. In Abraham, we see how prayer is not only or even chiefly the means of obtaining blessing for ourselves, but is the exercise of his royal prerogative to influence the destinies of men and the will of God which rules them. We do not once find Abraham praying for himself. His prayer for Sodom and Lot, for Amalek, for Ishmael, prove what power a man who is God's friend has to make the history of those around him. This had been man's destiny from the first. Scripture not only tells us this, but also teaches us how it was that God could entrust man with such a high calling. It was because he was created, he had created him in his own image and likeness. The external rule was not committed to him without the inner fitness. The bearing God's image and having dominion and being Lord of all had its root in the inner likeness in his nature. There was an inner agreement and harmony between God and man, an incipient godlikeness which gave man a real fitness for being the mediator between God and his world. For he was to be a prophet, priest, and king, to interpret God's will, to represent nature's needs, to receive and dispense God's bounty. It was in bearing God's image that he could bear God's will. He was indeed so like God, so capable of entering into God's purpose and carrying out his plans, that God could trust him with the wonderful privilege of asking and obtaining what the world might need. And although sin has, for a time, frustrated God's plans, prayer still remains what it would have been if man had never fallen. The proof of man's godlikeness, the vehicle of his intercourse with the infinite unseen one, the power that is allowed to hold the hand that holds the destinies of the universe. Prayer is not merely the cry of the supplicant for mercy. It is the highest forthputting of his will by man knowing himself to be of divine origin, created for and capable of being, in king-like liberty, the executor of the counsels of the eternal. What sin destroyed, grace has restored. What the first Adam lost, the second has won back. In Christ, man regains his original position, and the church, abiding in Christ, 
in here is the promise. Ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Such a promise does by no means, in the first place, refer to the grace or blessing we need for ourselves. It has reference to our position as the fruit-bearing branches of the heavenly vine, who, like him, only live for the work and glory of the Father. It is for those who abide in him, who have forsaken himself, to take up their abode in him with his life in obedience and self-sacrifice, who have lost their life and found it in him, who are now entirely given up to the interests of the Father and his kingdom. These are they who understand how their new creation has brought them back to their original destiny, has restored God's image and likeness, and with it the power to have dominion. Such have indeed the power, each in his own circle, to obtain and dispense the power powers of heaven here on earth. With holy boldness they may make known what they will. They live as priests in God's presence, as kings in the powers of the world to come began to be at their disposal. Footnote. God is seeking priests among the sons of men. A human priesthood is one of the essential parts of his eternal plan. To rule creation by man is his design. To carry on the worship of creation by man is no less part of his design. Priesthood is the appointed link between heaven and earth, the channel of intercourse between the sinner and God. Such a priesthood, insofar as expiation is concerned, is in the hands of the Son of God alone, insofar as it is to be the medium of communication between Creator and creature. It is also in the hands of the redeemed men of the Church of God. God is seeking kings, not out of the ranks of angels. All a man must furnish him with the rulers of his universe. Human hands must weld the scepter. Human heads must wear the crown. Out of the Rent Veil by Dr. H. Bullnard. End of footnote. They enter into the fulfillment of the promise. Ask whatsoever you will, it shall be done unto you. Church of the living God, thy calling is higher and holier than thou knowest. Though through thy members, as kings and priests, unto God, would God rule the world, their prayers bestow, and withhold the blessings of heaven. In his elect, who are, who are not just content to be themselves saved, but yield themselves holy, that through them, even as through the Son, the Father may fulfill all his glorious counsel, in these his elect, who cry day and night unto him, God would prove how wonderful man's original destiny was. As the image bearer of God on earth, the earth was indeed given into his hand. When he fell, all fell with him. The whole creation groaned and travailed in pain together. But now he is redeemed. The restoration of the original destiny has begun. It is in very deed God's purpose that the fulfillment of his eternal purpose and the coming of his kingdom should depend on those of his people who, abiding in Christ, are ready to take up their position in him, their head, the great priest king and in their prayers are bold enough to say what they will that their God should do. As image-bearer and representatives of God on earth, redeemed man has by his prayers to determine the history of this earth. Man was created and now and has now again been redeemed to pray, and by his prayers to have dominion. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, what is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Psalms 8 Lord God, how low has sin made man to sink, and how terrible has it darkened his mind that he does not even know his divine destiny to be thy servant and representative. Alas, that even thy people, when their eyes are opened, are so little ready to accept their calling and to seek to have power with God, that they may have power with men too. Bless them. To bless them. Lord Jesus, it is in thee. The Father hath again crowned man with glory and honor and opened the way for us to be what he would have us. 
O oh Lord, have mercy on thy people and visit thy heritage. Work mightily in thy church and teach thy believing disciples to go forth in their royal priesthood and in the power of prayer to which thou hast given such wonderful promises to serve thy kingdom, to have rule over the nations, and to make a name of God glorious in the earth. Amen. With Christ in the School of Prayer, 19th Lesson, I Go Unto the Father, or Power for Praying and Working. Quote, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. Unquote. John 14, 12 through 13. As the Savior opens his public ministry with his disciples by the Sermon on the Mount, so he closes it by the parting address preserved to us by John. In both he speaks more than once of prayer, but with a difference. In the Sermon on the Mount, it is as to disciples who have only just entered his school, who scarcely know that God is their Father, and whose prayer, chiefly, has reference to our personal needs. In his closing address, he speaks to disciples whose training time is now come to an end, and who are ready as his messengers to take his place in his work. In the former, the chief lesson is, be childlike, pray believingly, and trust the Father that he will give you all good gifts. Here he points to something higher. They are now his friends to whom he has made known all that he has heard of the Father, his messengers who have entered into his plans and into whose hands the care of his work and kingdom on earth is to be entrusted. They are now to go out and do his works, and in the power of his approaching exaltation, even greater works. Prayer is now to be the channel through which that power is to be received for their work. With Christ's ascension to the Father, a new epoch commences for their working and praying both. See how clearly this connection comes out in our text. As his body here on earth, as those who are one with him in heaven, they are now to do greater works than he had done. Their success and their victories are to be greater than his. He mentions two reasons for this. The one, because he was to go to the Father to receive all power. The other, because they might now ask and expect all in his name. Because I go to the Father and... Notice this, and, and, whatsoever you shall ask, I will do. His going to the Father would thus bring the double blessing. They would ask and receive all in his name, and as a consequence would do the greater works. This first mention of prayer in our Savior's parting words thus teaches us two most important lessons. He that would do the works of Jesus must pray in his name. He that would pray in his name must work in his name. He who would work must pray. It is in prayer that the power of work is obtained. He that in faith would do the works that Jesus did must pray in his name. As long as Jesus was here on earth, he himself did the greatest works. Devils the disciples could not cast out fled at his word. When he went to the Father, he was no longer here in the body to work directly. The the disciples were now his body. All his work from the throne in heaven, here on earth must and could be done through him. One might have thought that now he was leaving the scene himself and could only work through commissioners. The works might be fewer and weaker. He assures us of the contrary. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and he shall do greater works. His approaching death was to be such a real breaking down in making an end of power of sin, with the resurrection the powers of the, of the eternal life were so truly to take possession of the human body and to obtain supremacy over human life. With his assumption, he was to receive the power to communicate the Holy Spirit so fully to his own. The union, the oneness between himself and the throne, and them on earth was to be so intensely and divinely perfect that he meant it as the literal truth. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. And the issue proved how true it was. While Jesus, during three years of personal labor on earth, gathered little more than 500 disciples, and the most of them so feeble that they were a little credit to his cause, it was given to men like Peter and Paul, magnificently, to do greater works than he had done. 
from the throne, he could do through them what he himself in his humiliation could not yet do. But there is one condition, quote, he that believeth on me, he shall do greater works, because I go to the Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do, unquote. His going to the Father would give him a new power to hear prayer. For the doing of the greater works, two things were needed. His going to the Father to receive all power, our prayer in his name to receive all power from him again. As he asks the Father, he receives and bestows on us the power of the new dispensation for the greater works. As we believe and ask in his name, the power comes and takes possession of us to do the greater works. Alas, how much working there is in the work of God, in which there is little or nothing to be seen of the power to do anything like Christ's works. Now, to speak of greater works, there can be but one reason, the believing on him, the believing prayer in his name. This is so much wanting. Oh, that every laborer and leader in church or school, in the work of home philanthropy or foreign missions, might learn the lesson. Prayer in the name of Jesus is the way to share in the mighty power which Jesus has received of the Father for his people. And it is in this power alone that he that believeth can do the greater works. To every complaint as to weakness or unfitness, as to difficulties or want of success, Jesus gives us one answer. He that believeth on me shall do greater works, because I go to the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. We must understand that the first and chief thing for everyone who would do the work of Jesus is to believe. And so to get linked to him, the Almighty One, and then to pray the prayer of faith in his name. Without this, our work is but human and carnal. It may have some use in restraining sin or preparing the way for blessing, but the real power is wanting. Effectual working needs first effectual prayer. And now the second lesson. He who would pray must work. It is for power to work that prayer has such great promises. It is in working that the power for the effectual prayer of faith will be granted. In these parting words of our blessed Lord, we find that he no less than six times, John 14, 13, and 14, John 15, 7, and 16, John 16, 23, and 24, repeats those unlimited prayer promises with, see, which have so often awakened our anxious questions as to the real meaning. Whatsoever, anything, what you will, ask and you shall receive. How many a believer has read these over with joy and hope and in deep earnestness of soul has sought to plead them for his own need, and he has come out disappointed. The simple reason was this. He had rent away the promise from its surrounding. The Lord gave the wonderful promise of the free use of his name with the Father in connection with the doing of his works. It is the disciple who gives himself wholly to live for Jesus' work and kingdom, for his will and honor, to whom the power will come to appropriate the promise. He that would fain grasp the promise when he wants something very special for himself will be disappointed, because he would make Jesus a servant of his own comfort. But to him who seeks to pray the effectual prayer of faith, because he needs it for the work of the Master, to him it will be given to learn, because he has made himself the servant of his Lord's interests. Prayer not only teaches and strengthens to work, work teaches and strengthens to pray. This is in perfect harmony with what holds good, both in the natural and spiritual world. Whosoever hath to him shall be given, or he that is faithful in a little is faithful also in much. Let us with a small measure of grace already received give ourselves to the Master for his work. Work will be to us a a real school of prayer. It was when Moses had to take charge full charge of a rebellious people, that he felt the need, but also the courage, to speak boldly to God and to ask great things of him. Exodus 33, verse 12, 15, and 18. As you give yourself entirely to God for his work, you will feel that nothing less than these great promises are what you need, that nothing less is what you may most confidently expect. Believer in Jesus, you are called. You are appointed to do the works of Jesus, and even greater works, because he has gone to the Father to receive the power to do them in and through you. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. Give yourself and live to do the works of Christ, 
and you will learn to pray so as to obtain wonderful answers to prayer. Give yourself and live to pray, and you will learn to do the works he did, and greater works. With disciples full of faith in himself, and bold in prayer to ask great things, Christ can conquer the world. Lord, teach us to pray. O my Lord, I have this day again heard words from thee which pass my comprehension. And yet I cannot do aught but in simple, childlike faith, take and keep them as thy gift to me too. Thou hast said that in virtue of thy going to the Father, he that believeth on thee will do the works which thou hast done in greater works. Lord, I worship thee as a glorified one, and look for the fulfillment of thy promise. May my whole life just be one of continued believing in thee, so purified and sanctify my heart. Make it so tenderly susceptible of thyself and thy love that believing on thee may be the very life it breathes. And thou hast said that in virtue of thy going to the Father, whatsoever we ask thou wilt do. From thy throne of power thou wouldest make thy people share the power given thee and work through them as the members of thy body in response to their believing prayers in thy name. Power and prayer with thee and power and work with men is what thou hast promised thy people and me too. Blessed Lord, forgive us all that we have so little believed thee and thy promise and so little proved thy faithfulness in fulfilling it. Well, forgive us that we have so little honored thy all prevailing name in heaven and upon earth. Lord, teach me to pray so that I may prove that thy name is indeed all prevailing with God and man and devils. Yea, teach me so to work and to pray that thou canst glorify thyself in me as the omnipotent one and do thy great works through me too. Amen. With Christ in the School of Prayer 20th Lesson that the Father may be glorified, or the chief end of prayer. Quote, I go unto the Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Unquote. John 14.13 That the Father may be glorified in the Son. It is to this end that Jesus on the throne in glory will do all we ask in his name. Every answer to prayer he gives will have this as its object. When there is no prospect of this object being attained, he will not answer. It follows, as a matter of course, that this must be with us as with Jesus, the essential element in our partitions. The glory of the Father must be the aim and end, the very soul and life of our prayer. It was so with Jesus when he was on earth. I seek not mine own honor, I seek the honor of him that sent me. In such words we have the keynote of his life. In the first words of the high priestly prayer, he gives utterance to it. Quote, Father, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. I have glorified thee on earth. Glorify me with thyself. Unquote. The ground on which he asked to be taken up into the glory he had with the Father is the twofold one. He has glorified him on earth. He will still glorify him in heaven. What he asks is only to enable him to glorify the Father more. It is as we enter into sympathy with Jesus on this point and gratify him by making the Father's glory our chief object in prayer too, that our prayer cannot fail of an answer. There is nothing of which the beloved Son has said more distinctly, that it will glorify the Father than this, his doing what we ask. He will not, therefore, let any opportunity slip of securing this object. Let us make his aim ours. Let the glory of the Father be the link between our asking and his doing. Such prayer must prevail. Footnote. See in the note on George Mueller at the end of this volume how he was led to make God's glory his first object. End of the footnote. We'll read that later. This word of Jesus comes indeed as a sharp two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit 
and quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus, in his prayers on earth, in his intercession in heaven, in his promise of an answer to our prayers from there, makes this his first object, the glory of his Father. It is so with us, too. Or are not, in large measure, self-interest and self-will, the strongest motives urging us to pray. Or if we cannot see that this is the